Welcome everybody. My name is Aaron Mertz and I'm the founding director of the Aspen Institute Science and Society program, whose mission is to advance science for the public good. This virtual discussion today will dissect the current state of basic or fundamental research around the world, create a public forum for discussion among scientific leaders and provide guidance for how to make basic science more supported and how we can advance it internationally. The symposium accompanies publication of the global report in favor of pure science, written in collaboration among the 14 countries where the Aspen Institute has partnering organizations. This work has been supported by the Kavli Foundation, whose mission is to advance science for the benefit of humanity. The speakers today were among the participants who contributed to each country's chapter to this report. Unfortunately, Magdalena Skipper from the United Kingdom had an emergency and is unable to participate. We are joined by seven esteemed experts from half of the Aspen Institute countries, Ukraine, Romania, Italy, New Zealand, Colombia, Mexico, and the United States. They will engage in rotating paired conversations. Throughout, we welcome you to submit questions in the chat or Q&A feature, and my colleague Jelana and I will field them to the speakers at the end of the discussion. First, Jelana will introduce two of our guests who will give brief introductory remarks. Thank you, Erin. My name is Jelana Sheets, and I'm a behavioral scientist by training and currently a civic science fellow with the Aspen Institute Science and Society program. I am excited to introduce Angelo Maria Petroni, full professor of logic and philosophy of science at La Sapienza University in Rome and secretary general of the Aspen Institute Italia. Angelo spearheaded the idea for the Aspen Institute to examine basic science globally. And that effort aligns with the pillars of the science and society program. And we are happy to bring it to life. So, Will I speak? Yes, Angelo, you can proceed with your introduction. Yeah, yeah. There we are. I've seen Angela, Angela, it's Antoni, the wrong in mixing the two names. Uh, thank you so much for this introduction. Uh, thank you to you, thank you to Aaron, thank you to Aspen US, which decided to start this program. And as, as Aspen Italia, we did join with very and with a lot of enthusiasm and personally being a philosopher of science i was also enthusiastic about this for the idea of how to make the public opinion more inclined more prone to foster to sustain uh, pure science uh, there are a lot of uh, initiatives in the world in favor of pure science. They are made by scientists, scientific societies, academias. Well, normally they don't get any result because when governments say that, uh, see that a scientist ask for more money for science, they say, well, that's obvious. So, uh, the issue, real issue for having more resources and a more friendly climate for pure science is not just a matter of money, is to have the public opinions in the world, uh, in democratic countries that are coming to be persuaded that an increase in pure science is the best thing they can have for themselves and for the future generation from the moral point of view, from the civic point of view, and also from the economic point of view. So uh, I was so happy to see all, all our friends in different countries where there is an Aspen to participate to this program. As Aspen Italia, uh, we did our job and we are ready to continue this because this is not a program which is one shot is a continuous program which must go on in order to obtain some results. Thank you so much, Aaron, and thank you to Aspen US for this wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo. Thank you, Angelo. 
And so now we'll hear some um, uh, introductory remarks from Marina Frasca-Spada, who will also provide um, um, insight on this. Marina is a fellow at the Corpus Christi College and an affiliated lecturer at the um, Faculty of Philosophy and, the, um, and at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. Welcome, Marina. Thank you very much, Juliana, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I have been teaching philosophy of science at the University of Cambridge in the UK for um, to students in philosophy or in the natural sciences for over 30 years. So, so you will understand I have a special interest in the situation of younger generations. Students at Cambridge are selected through a very competitive process, the average ratio of admissions to application being around one to five. So they are very capable, committed, curious, ambitious. Many of them are also instinctively aware both of the pleasures that knowledge per se can afford and of its less obvious and predictable longer term value. This means in an elite institution such as this, there are still good numbers of young people who do uh, plan and do research and at various levels from undergraduate to postdoctoral projects just out of intellectual curiosity and for the love of knowledge. For all that, even here, I have personally witnessed the shift in the range of students' interests and career choices. To some extent, this is obviously determined by funding and I don't need to elaborate on this. Even here, it's a lot easier these days to get funding for researching a longer lived battery than anything in particle physics. But there is also a psychological aspect to this. Subjects such as pure maths or theoretical physics now tend more and more to be associated with the arts and humanities rather than with the cooler applied or more vocational subjects such as engineering, medicine, computer sciences, law. So more and more like classical studies, history or literature, now the pure sciences are in danger of being perceived as either luxuries or eccentricities. And it does make sense that young people are keen on choosing something that is not a luxury or an eccentricity, but something that's useful and also, if at all possible, profitable. This is reflected in the dramatically increased demand for one year postgraduate programs, many of them taught courses rather than research, and all of them invariably very applied, very vocational. Their number is now rapidly and steadily growing everywhere even in this university. And this is all the more striking in comparison with the tendency towards decline in the numbers for pure research degrees, especially the PhD, which is quintessentially academic, notoriously loneliness inducing and whose usefulness is now often even questioned. And yet, in my view, this does not correspond to a loss on the part of the younger generations of intellectual adventurousness or curiosity for knowledge for its own sake. In fact, they do seem to me to be very ready to be seduced by, the, by its attractions. And I would know since I teach them the critique of pure reason. A quick example to conclude, a group of researchers here at Cambridge has organized in the past couple of years, a program called STEM Smart. This consists of interactive online and in-person teaching support in STEM subjects aimed at British school children between 16 and 17, usually mainly from educationally disadvantaged or underrepresented backgrounds. Without going into details, what's on offer is a lot more challenging than anything these students do at school or indeed need in order to pass their exams with flying colors. And it's a lot of work for them. The organizers expected up to five, 600 applicants. Well, last year they got twice as many. And this year, the number has already topped 2000 and growing. Clearly interest, curiosity and enthusiasm are there. So the problem is presumably that the young seem to be constantly nudged in one direction, the wrong one. And I suspect their enthusiasm does not decline, but is rapidly channeled by this pressure towards more pragmatic choices. I think it would be well worth trying to give them a hand and reverse this. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marina. Now for our first conversation, Natalia Shulga from the Ukraine will introduce, or will, sorry, will interview Roxana Voiku from Romania. Natalia Shulga is the executive director of the Ukrainian Science Club, and Roxana Voiku is the associate professor at the Bucharest University of Economic Studies. I'll hand it over to you two. Hi, Roxana. Hello, Natalia. Okay. Um, with this little time, I just uh, would love to ask you a few questions. Um, you participated in this study for the value of pure science uh, because in your country, you can definitely can observe decline of financing for pure science. And as a consequence of that, also decline of the production of new technologies and new um, Thanks. Uh, what is your um, view of the possible changes in your country from bringing financing of pure science from 0.5% higher, 0.5% uh, of GDP, I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for the question. There are a couple of elements that I would like to, to add to the conversation. The first one links to what uh, Professor Frasca Spada was mentioning earlier. Being a researcher is not cool anymore. Um, and the coolness, to use a, a word of the youth, links to uh, the um, predisposition of young of youth to coming to pure science, to have the curiosity to discover the world. Um, and that links actually to two elements. The fact that pragmatism pushes them to jobs that will offer them quick wins and quick money. And the second one relates to the communication of pure science within them. Um, so the first element that we would build upon to make pure science more attractive in Romania would be to bring it back or try to bring it back the school factor. The second element relates to public policies. And uh, mostly in the past 20 to 30 years, because we have an economy that's growing, that was striving to become part of the European Union and so on and so forth, the I key idea was to boost the economy, to make it more competitive. Therefore, science was pushed more towards applied science, close to market, easily marketable, easily transferable into solutions. So public policy was mostly targeting that. However, even that thing was doing um, to the detriment of pure science. And lastly, that type of policy was also scattered all over the place because right now we are trying to push uh, within the community proper procedures, for instance, for tech transfer or knowledge transfer linked to the European Union. The third element that I would add to the conversation regarding Romania is the fact, or the glimmer of hope as, as we called it in the, in the report, which is the largest laser in the world that we are privileged to have here. And that was considered to be a step forward towards first, uh, catalyzing the ecosystem of research in Romania. And lastly, uh, to bring that back that cool factor. It's uh, to have that thing of a largest laser in the world means bringing science closer to the people. And it is extremely interesting to see that the age of researchers on the LINP platform is probably lower than mine, which is not saying a lot about me, but uh, of course it links to it. But uh, circling back to that, I think that we, um, in the Romanian situation, we have to balance this competitiveness need and having science towards driving the competitiveness of Romania versus having pure science. There's another element, and with that I'll close and, and go back to your questions, another element to consider, which is where the IP, the intellectual property is actually placed. Because when we're talking about incentivizing companies to support pure science and so on and so forth, we actually see that not a lot of policies in Romania target 
keeping the intellectual property in the country. Although there are research institutes, although there is research in companies, the intellectual property is not, is not in house. So, but um, we might circle back to that, please. Um, well, in my opinion, Ukraine and Romania are very similar in our approaches to not only pure science, but the whole system of education and research. Mm -hmm. Um, I also found very intriguing how to, this question, how to bring young generation or the next generation to this, um, not only curiosity, uh, which was mentioned by our uh, colleague in, in a British, top British university, um, curiosity is always there, but how to make it a life uh, dedication, a life term uh, profession, that's the biggest question. In Ukraine, we observed that very little amount of girls going to scientific careers. And we managed to develop the whole uh, nationwide program for girls in STEM mm -hmm. by bringing uh, to these um, schools, the children, uh, very prominent and very um, uh, successful entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. started as the researchers and then through technology transfer were able to found their companies and became very successful in economic uh, area. So this uh, line between uh, pure research, technology based on it and future economic development became more understandable and more girls start choosing these careers. So my question for Romania, did you look at that opportunities? Because I think we are going through all this post-Soviet transformation. Mm -hmm. You are more lucky being the member, full member of the European Union. We are still struggling for that. And now you can see we're really um, struggling with blood uh, to, to be accepted. But um, uh, what is your opinion on, uh, you know, bringing well, more there are numerous similarities between the systems because we are um, tributary to the same type of right. communist structure, right? So we right. had universities and we had research institutes. And after 1990, it was a struggle to remodel this in a way that makes sense, that brings competitiveness and so on and so forth. One thing that could be done uh, is to have examples of successful researchers. Um, we have questions in the Q&A that links exactly to that. Show me an example of something that's meaningful and the researcher is doing. And we don't have that in, in the media. We have examples of research that has turned into um, successful business into a successful startup, into a solution that's marketable, but we don't have examples in pure science. So we don't have influencers, science influencers. Secondly, uh, one thing that is done and that could be considered as a best practice is the fact that we have quite a famous physicist that explains things and makes it quite attractive uh, online on social media. So he's shared and so on and so forth. By making that a point of science being cool and attracting kids into this. Apart from that, there are programs like you've mentioned, the one with women in STEM and so on and so forth, just to bring back that. However, keep in mind that we lose from the first year of, of primary education to the last year of um, graduate education, about half of them. So they get lost on the way. And pure science is something that's done at the latter part of, um, I mean, pure science research is done at the latter part of the analysis uh, or at the educational um, path. But they have to have the curiosity and the want. So we actually should work on two separate parts. One, attracting kids towards science. And you can only make that if you speak their language and boost their curiosity. 
and then follow them on their educational path until they reach the point of becoming a researcher. And I think that's that's yeah. our cue. I think, yeah. Thank you, Roxanne. Very well. Thank you so much, Natalia. Yeah. Thank you, um, Natalia and yeah. Roxanne. Um, for jumpstarting the conversation. You all had some really great insights. And so thank you for that. And so now we're going to um, introduce um, Angela Santoni um, into the conversation. Angela is based in Italy and is the head of the Department of Molecular Medicine, Sapienza, and the university, at the University of Rome. And so just give us one second. And we will bring in Angela. Okay, um, I, I have to just say that I am not the head of the department anymore because I, um, I retired uh, two years ago. And uh, at the moment uh, I am emeritus professor of, of immunology at Sapienza University. I still are involved in science in particular I am the scientific director of the Pasteur Institute uh, Italia, which is in Roma. And there was mm. one also in Romania actually in the past. Um, okay, so this is my... It's such an honor to interview you in this conversation, Professor Santoni. Um, Angela. You <laughs> Thank you so much. You are a pure, between the two of us, you are a pure scientist. I'm an economist and that does not qualify as pure science. Um, but the question is, since you've seen the whole, um, the whole path, you've gone through your career in research institutes and in the university, what's the status in Italy? And uh, considering it's part of the European Union, so much of it is part of that huge conglomerate. What's your insight? Okay, so uh, the, the, the pure science then is uh, usually funded by government. And uh, what I, I should say that the Italian research system is clearly underfunded. If I think about the public investment uh, uh, on pure science is no less than 0.5% of uh, GDP. So the gross domestic product, which uh, is really behind uh, the roughly 2.2 uh, average of the European country. And uh, in, in addition, the number of researchers in Italy is uh, quite lower uh, as compared to countries such as uh, France or Germany. So it, it's almost half. I have to say that there was really a, a re big reduction in the number of scientists in the period from uh, 2008 to 2019. Um, uh, 1,400 uh, Italian scientists, young Italian scientists, left the country. And this is was uh, because uh, in 2018, with the government of that time, there was a big cut in the budget for uh, basic fundamental uh, research. So, and the Italian researchers who leave the country, they usually remain in Europe or in the United States, they don't, don't come back. However, Despite uh, the in inadequacy of the, the resources, of mainly of the financial resources, also the number of researchers, uh, the quality of science in Italy is quite good, I should say. And I don't know whether this means that you can, can make a good uh, research even uh, with uh, a low amount uh, of money. But, uh, uh, and also the citational impact of the research, at least for some uh, disciplines, is very high. It's higher than uh, the average in Europe. So um, overall, I should say that uh, this is uh, actually rather important. In the 
last uh, government led by Mario Draghi, uh, there was a big uh, um, increase in the amount of money put for basic science, uh, about uh, 11 billions of euros, mainly coming from the, the recovery fund, the pandemic uh, recovery fund from uh, the European Union. And that actually, that was uh, relatively important. And uh, I think that um, Mario Draghi was relatively really sensitive to the problem of public science and mainly of uh, uh, basic and fundamental science. And they, they also, in particular, the Ministry of uh, uh, Research and the University the last Ministry of Research at the University, Cristina Messa, uh, they set up a, a special task to uh, elaborate a, a strategic plan for uh, promoting and boost uh, science. And there was a committee, and actually this was collecting a number of appeals from uh, many uh, repeated appeals from many science uh, in physics, uh, uh, the Nobel Prize Giorgio Parisi, Luciano Maiani, and so on. So, and, um, and the, this uh, task force developed uh, a strategic plan from uh, uh, 2222 two from this year uh, until 2027. And actually there was a, a national um, uh, program of research already in Italy, which actually uh, um, took in consideration uh, which were the problems uh, and, and they trying to find objective. But there was no money allocated on this national uh, uh, research program until 27. So the plan, this task, and I have the privilege to be part of this committee, of this task force, what uh, they recommend to increase the public fund to reach at least uh, in 2027, 0.7% uh, of uh, GDP, uh, which is the level of France at the moment. So not right now, currently, uh, changing uh, the way in which the money is allocated in the sense that uh, in Italy, sometimes it's very difficult to program science because they, 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 they are quite fragmented, the resources, the financial resources, and there is no regular calls that uh, are made. So this creates uh, a lot of instability. In addition, we also consider the, the way of the evaluation and we envisage to have a structure which was really dedicated to ex ante and ex post uh, uh, evaluation of the project uh, using international standard because usually the rate of success of, um, of the project or the national um, uh, programs is, is uh, non higher than uh, 10%. So we want to have a, a better type of evaluation and also more money in a way that we can increase the rate of success at least to 20, 30%. The other thing that, that uh, uh, this uh, re research uh, plan was taking in consideration also some disparities that we have in Italy, in particular the north and the south. Mm -hmm. They are quite different. Qu question, because Aaron, I think, is pushing us to wrap up, uh, and we would like a brief answer for, from you. What do you think the rate of success of this plan that looks great is will it deliver the proper impact or will it need continuous support uh, i i don't know because now we have a new ministry a new government and we are trying to make uh, 
this plan uh, uh, also considered by the new ministry. Right now, all the scientific society are trying to write a letter to the ministry to support uh, this plan. And uh, really, I don't know what we can expect, but we are really, we need to continue to push to have uh, an improvement of in finance in basic science, certainly. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Santoni. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you. Now I'm pleased to introduce Richard Blakey. He is the from New Zealand and he is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Enterprise and a professor in physics at the University of Otago. Angela Santoni will now interview him. Okay, uh, Professor uh, Blakey. What I would like to ask you, how is the situation in New Zealand? Uh, is certainly better. Oh, I think that the number of scientists there should be not very high, but uh, and, and in a way this could be an advantage, but uh, I don't know, I'd like to. And I'll like, since you are so far away, how do you collaborate? Uh, with uh, people yeah. uh, uh, in the world. Kia ora and, well, and welcome from New Zealand. Please accept my apologies. I had to go to my phone. My, uh, my hotel internet is quite unstable. Uh, but yes, how is the situation in New Zealand? It is not dissimilar from other countries. And in fact, Angela, your, uh, your <clears throat> uh, investment in 0.5% of GDP into from the government into research is very similar to New Zealand as a proportion of GDP. We also have aspirations for economic transformation based on uh, science-led innovation. Uh, and so we do have uh, government policy that has been supportive of basic science along, alongside um, applied sciences. Um, career stability is also um, something that is a focus of the current government with um, a lot of our, our research workforce in precarious roles uh, on short-term contracts uh, and that is reflective also of the nature of the research investment and I think as you and others have pointed out <clears throat> the very competitive nature of, of research investment. Um, I could expand on those I'll, I'll probably just say I think we're in a we're in a position very very similar to other nations that uh, I don't hear you. Please excuse me. I think my internet fell out, but the need for increasing investment is always there. Uh, in terms of collaboration internationally, um, I think what the pandemic has taught us is that we can connect uh, very well um, using virtual tools. And uh, whilst borders are open now, we are connecting uh, in person. Um, New Zealand is a highly connected country to the world, and uh, I don't think I don't think our geographical location is as much of a barrier as it has been in the past. Uh, one thing I think we're looking forward to very much is um, uh, a prospect for New Zealand to become an associate member of the EU Horizons program, which will connect us much more intimately to European science, in particular. Okay, yes, this is true uh, that, uh, of course, we can exchange internet. But what about the mobility of people? And uh, there are, your country can attract uh, people from abroad or yeah. Uh, so? Yeah, one, one, one policy we've had for a long time is uh, to encourage um, international students into New Zealand at advanced level. So for, for doctoral training, um, students come to New Zealand uh, from anywhere around the world and get treated as domestic students. So access to fees, support and scholarships is the same for international students as for domestic students. In contrast for undergraduate training, uh, we see 
encouragement of undergraduate training as, a, as an export to education as contribution directly to the economy, whereas at the doctoral training level, we see it as intellectual contribution. And um, so we, we, have, uh, we are a very attractive destination. In fact, typically half of our PhD students in universities are international students and half domestic. In terms of mobility, uh, New Zealanders, young New Zealanders like to travel very much. So um, probably one third to one half of our PhD graduates do they do they come back to New Zealand? I'm sorry, I just dropped out again. I missed I missed the question. Uh, do they come back to New Zealand once they leave the country? Yes, some do and some don't. But those that don't, uh, it's a it's a wonderful diaspora that uh, we have. Uh, we have some very strong networks of New Zealanders who are leading large international research labs who are successful in companies overseas. And then they are the ones that will uh, help host uh, young New Zealanders or international students from New Zealand, but also will be very much encouraging uh, people to return to New Zealand when they can. So I think the mobility, the mobility from New Zealand was probably not as high as within Europe, for example, but we are very well connected to the world. We're an attractive destination for talent. We have a phrase that New Zealand should be the place where talent wants to live, uh, but we're very proud that we send our best and brightest also to work with you in Italy or in the United States or in, in other parts of the world. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And please accept my apologies again for my uh, unstable internet. <laughs> Great, thank you. And so now, um, so now we'll introduce um, Sylvia Restrepo, uh, who will be interviewed by uh, Richard Blakey. And so uh, Sylvia Restrepo is from Colombia and is the Vice President of Academic Affairs and Vice President of Research and Creation at the Universidad de Los Andes. Hello, Hello. Sylvia. Hi, Richard. Yeah, so, so welcome. Um, so tell us a little bit about Colombia. I'm a cyclist. I know that you produce great cyclists, but uh, what about your science and your science system? Okay, we produce good coffee that I have here close to my, <laughs> to my computer. So that's, that's a good product we have from Colombia. Thank you so much. Yeah, Colombian. Well, uh, I think we have heard this from everybody else, and we have a, a we have little funding for uh, research, and actually for what we have called here. And I think in the Q and A section there is a discussion about if we have to call it pure science or fundamental science or basic science. Well, the funding for basic science is is really low, and I think we are probably the lower in in the region if not in the in the well of course in the continent but also with the central america so and um, i think also richard that we have a, a, a real problem also in in education and um, i think that is where all the problems start and uh, we must fulfill the deficit we have in primary and secondary education. And I think that's, that's the, the biggest problem we have. When we see the PISA evaluations in the world, we are always ranked very, very low. And uh, I think a starting point would be to strengthen the capacity and vision of the primary and secondary school teachers to start this basic research stimulation at a very early years of, uh, of education, especially in, the, in, in primary uh, education. I think the second point also, Richard, and I think we share this with a, a lot of countries, is communication, is how we tell the stories behind science. The pandemic helped uh, because uh, probably surprisingly in Colombia, we had a very good acceptance of vaccines and people embrace them and, and embrace the, 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 
the power of science. And that was a very good thing. But we have to see how we are communicating the, the science, the stories behind science, and also the role models we have, especially for women in science. In science. And of course, I mentioned that, but uh, I think the third problem is um, the funding. I, I mentioned this. And I, I'd like to, to end this question also, Blake, uh, Richard. I'm sorry, I was going to your last name, Blakey. Uh, Richard, um, I think the system we have in science and technology, all the research in Colombia relies on the universities. Universities do 90% of the research. We have very few centers of research and the centers are, are the ones that are uh, called to do this transfer, this tech transfer of the, of the basic science, of this, the knowledge from universities to the society and to attract society. So universities, we have to multiply our roles. And I think that put a lot of tension in, in our system. I don't know if uh, I have internet problems or is Richard? It looks like his internet uh, went out again. Maybe we just wait. Um, okay. It's seconds. not me, right? It, no. It's so not I'm not sure if you can hear me. I, I have dropped out again. Yes. Yes, Richard, we lost you a little bit. Yeah. And now we lost him completely. Right, I'll, oh, Richard, you're here again. <laughs> so am I back online now? Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure yeah. if we can, we, can, we can hear you well, but we can try. So am I back online now, Sylvia? Yes, I can hear you, Richard. Can you hear us, Richard? No, he's not. He has really bad connection. No, no, am I back online now? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, I will just wrap up with a couple of questions or, or a, a comment. You were talking very well about that science connection to technology, but also science and society and the need to educate uh, a, a, um, a science literate community. Um, are there any specific schemes that will help to train teachers or to have what we call citizen science uh, um, active in Colombia? Well, uh, no, I would. I have to to answer no to that question. We don't have very active schemes to do this uh, citizen science, and uh, I was telling you about the poor system in science and technology we have in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So we have these universities, but we miss all these also centers for the, the society in general, like mm -hmm. museums of natural history. We yeah. don't have a museum of natural history in one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. And so it's, it's incredible. That can help a lot to citizen science and to organize the, those, those activities. The, uh, well, actually the Ministry of Science and Technology is really recent. It only begin, it began on 2019. And then we got the pandemic, so we have a very young uh, minister, and they have a very good, uh, oh, they have very good ideas on uh, social uh, transfer of science, but they have they haven't had the time to put it in place. So we need uh, also a lot of constructing and building this system around the universities and around the centers of research to do the citizen science and this transfer to general society. Yeah. Richard? 
Okay, well, if, um, if you can hear that may be a good point to end this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Alain. Thank you. And now I'm pleased to introduce William Lee from Mexico. He is the scientific research coordinator at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And he'll be interviewed by Sylvia Restrepo. Thank you, Aaron. Hello, William. It's very nice to, to meet you. So I have a couple of questions. You come from Mexico, I come from Colombia, probably we have and share the same problems around these uh, thematics. And I want to start with a, a general question, and especially I want to hear your opinion about this tension we have in our universities, or probably you don't have that enough, but I want to, to, to know, between the standard evalu evaluation of science and impact. So in the University of Los Andes, we, the professors <clears throat> have, to, have three main responsibilities, teaching, research, and um, extension or social impact. And we recently introduced a new theme on impact and some professors, especially in physics, mathematics, and some engineering were very concerned about uh, what, uh, what will happen with basic and pure or uh, science. So I would like to know if you have those tensions and those discussions at UNAM. Hi, yes, thank you. So yes, we do, certainly. <laughs> and um, I think, Part of the, so the tension is real and there is inner tension and external tension from pressures outside the university. And it also has to do with how we have done things in the past, right? Because in Mexico, the scientific academic community has grown substantially if you compare it to what it was say 40 or 50 years ago, uh, when it was really, really tiny, now it's just small uh per capita if you consider the size of the country right we have 130 million mexicans and uh, if you look at the what we call the sistema nacional de investigadores to have a measure of how many people do research and and teaching at the higher level and outreach it's like 35,000 people so it's really small but the the rules and the focus on basic science and uh pure research that was um, begun 40 to 50 years ago served a purpose and it was okay we want to have some standards to grow this community with quality and so this had a certain way of happening in terms of impact in basic science and so on and that I think had very positive consequences uh, but now that we have grown and that other things are needed particularly linking to society and government and private sector and social sector, you have to change the rules of evaluation because otherwise people will just keep doing the same, right? So I, I, I would say that instead of switching over to impacts, you have to add them because you can't stop doing basic research and the pendulum swings, right? And if it goes too far off to one side, then you're not covering really what you need to. On the other hand, to get things moving in a different direction, sometimes you have to push more uh, in a more extreme fashion in that new direction. Um, so measuring in terms of what we usually use for basic science in terms of impact, which is papers and citations and referencing and so on, is obviously not what you want if you want social impact. But not all research is socially, can have a social impact immediately. So what I try to do sometimes is say, okay, Education and critical thinking are a social impact. And so if this happens to be in basic mathematics, in algebraic geometry or astronomy, or uh, the inner workings of DNA, just for the fun of it, then that is also a social impact in terms of critical thinking and forming people who will have an impact later on in any area of life that they decide to work in. Uh, but it is it is tricky, and I think the most important uh, sector that needs to modify the way it does things is the committees and commissions that do all the evaluating and hiring, 
And it's tricky because the people making up those commissions and committees are by definition experienced people, which means they are not the youngest and the most innovative and the most um, with the new drives for different topics. Uh, so it, it's a it's a peculiar issue. And and in Mexico, and I'm, I'm sure public universities in Colombia have the same overall background, the social place of the university in the country and in society is very important. Uh, and so the, the role that they play in defining what the impacts should be is critical. And it has to be self-managed in a very important way. It cannot come just from the outside if the university is going to be surviving and contributing what they should in the long term in the country. Yeah, thank you. And actually, my, my second question, or the one I was thinking about, is uh, related to this evaluation of the scientific performance. And um, I've been reading a lot uh, a long time ago. I saw the DORA declaration, the San Francisco and the Leiden Manifesto, and they all talk about the obsession with these indicators and the, also the obsession uh, about global rankings. And uh, every time we see a global ranking, everybody's nervous because they are not in the first place or second place. And sometimes a, a place can change only by one indicator, the age uh, factor or, or something uh, like that. But if we attack th that system and we try to go away from the system of the standard metrics, are we probably uh, putting a pressure on, on, on scientific, on basic uh, science? Do you think if we, uh, it's, uh, I'm talking a lot of tensions today, but it's also <clears throat> something that we deal with in the, in the universities. Go with the, the rankings or forget the rankings, but if we forget the rankings and the metrics behind the, the, the rankings, we can probably uh, can uh, put a pressure well, on scientific, on, on basic knowledge. Yeah, so I think, so I think obsession is the right word. <laughs> I, think, I think the rankings uh, have been pushed too far. Uh, it is a single indicator. It's, it's, it's based on a lot of indicators, of course, but it ends up being just one number. Uh, and, and I think that's a very poor representation of the richness of an institution, academic institution, even if you disaggregate it by fields or whatever, because the, the, local, the local context of the institution is lost. And I think that's a vital element. So, um, so yes, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of any individual indicator. I prefer, you know, a matrix of indicators to tell me other things and, and rankings particularly. I, I, I'm not particularly fond of them. Um, I think in terms of evaluation, we should think about, and I've had this discussion with colleagues many times, you know, what is it we want when we push a project or hire someone or promote someone or make a statement about quality, right? And so the the standard answer is we want the best. Okay, but the best has a very uh, variable concept depending on where you are and what you want to do. So this applies to educational background and gender and diversity and the community you want to reflect and uh, and uh, push for development. Um, so after you have a certain minimum which can be very high of academic requirements for teaching ability or research ability or uh, linking and innovation, then I think you should look to other criteria to ensure that you have quality because a diverse environment is a better place to generate uh, relations with society and quality and impactful research in the best sense in education and in the particular fields that you can work in. So, that's part of why I'm so at discomfort with single linear one digit um, rank numbers to rank and the, the, the rankings of universities in particular is one of them, but it goes across the field. Perfect, William, I think we are, we are done. We yeah. just arrived to the time limit. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure thank to you, be with you. Great, thank you so much. Um,
So now we will introduce um, Sheila uh, Jasinal from the United States. Um, and she's a professor um, of science and technology studies at Harvard, University, at Harvard uh, Kennedy School. And so she'll be interviewed by William. Okay. Hello, Sheila. Pleasure to meet you. Hi. Uh, so, so I'm going to go back a little bit into what was uh, being said earlier in terms of communicating with society. Um, so obviously, science by itself cannot pretend to solve uh, a lot of deeper issues that have to do with people's well-being, right? It's, uh, it's necessary that pure basic science be socially considered and appreciated and, and valued for what it is. And so that it be appropriated by society and culture as part of culture in order for it to thrive in the long term. Uh, you have devoted a considerable amount of energy and reflection to this topic. What, what are your thoughts on this in this context? Well, people sometimes think that it's up to, you know, everybody in the scientific community to be making the case for science. Uh, I'm always a little bit surprised at how scientists see the sort of existential threat to themselves because we keep getting in America uh, survey results showing that scientists remain, you know, at the top of the heap in terms of public trust, public confidence, at least in terms of expectation. I mean, what do people expect will be positive that's generated out of science? There's also a sort of tendency to collapse the very many different aspects of doing science into the single word science. And it's you know, for instance, hardly anybody in America needs to be um, coaxed into feeling excited about the latest uh, mm. astronomical venture and, you know, landing things on Mars or shooting down asteroids that are coming towards the Earth and so on and so forth. So sometimes I wonder whether the, the problem itself of non-communication is a construct that scientists have made up to some extent to justify you know, uh, or to comfort themselves about a kind of threat that they feel to their existence. And wouldn't people actually be more comfortable sort of doing the things that they're supposed to be doing and justifying them on the grounds of belief? I mean, that is, I do this because this is what, you know, what my calling is and, you know, what I work at best. Um, not worry so much about every young physicist needing to go out and, you know, communicate. Communicate with whom? I mean, most people are not going to understand the intricacies of quantum physics or, you know, quantum computing just because people go out and tell them. We have an entire social role of science journalists and media. There was a comment a while back from our colleague in Colombia about how there isn't a natural history museum, but I think that that acknowledges that there are other places in society that are responsible for doing the communication, or that would be better environments for the communication. And this uh, notion of a direct obligation on every scientist to also act as a communicator, whatever that means, strikes me as a little bit far-fetched and not actually tackling whatever the perceived problem is, even in its own terms. Yes, yeah, so I'm an astronomer, so I fully identify with some of your <laughs> examples. And, and I agree, every time we do, um, and with other colleagues in different areas, uh, public outreach events for, for a number of things, the response is fantastic, right? Um, it's it's more a little bit in terms of the well, so at least in Mexico and I know in the U.S. you know the past few years and sadly not alone, the disconnect is also with public administration and political decisions, right? Uh, in terms of the use of certain perceptions or factors uh, to make funding and priority decisions uh, that have, I think, an adverse effect on education in the very long term. Uh, so that is some of my concern. I mean, the disconnect may not be with, with the public, 
but there is, uh, to some degree, I think, in many countries, a disconnect with the political class, if you will. Uh, but that's not a failure of the science policy interaction. It's a failure of the political landscape and uh, and the interaction and decision making with with the public and and the functioning of elections. Uh, and one effect is in science and education. So it's a broader problem, I think. So I completely agree with that. I mean, I think that the question needs to revert to what do we think inquiry means to a citizenry, to a citizenry mm -hmm. that values certain kinds of freedoms and surely freedom of inquiry is one of those values that if people want to learn about something puzzling about the world, we do want energies to be loosened up, whatever that problem is. I mean, whether it is to get cheap drinking water to, to underserved communities or to take the lead out of decaying pipelines in, in, the, in US older cities, or whether it is uh, cracking the secrets of the latest subatomic structures that people have uncovered in whatever ways. So the tension that you're describing, of course, is that this is as old in the Judeo-Christian tradition as the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from that famous tree in Eden, that people are to some degree afraid that science or scientific study will produce either characterizations of problems that have been overlooked before or possible solutions to problems that then are unpalatable. I mean, this is the situation that has plagued climate change for a long time. Arguably, it is the situation that plagues gun violence in the United States as well. I mean, that is epidemiological style research that shows connections between factors that could be solved through public policy, but people just don't have the will to turn their minds to those problems. It's far better just not to generate knowledge, not to teach, and at the limit to burn the books or ban them from the libraries. Now, I think yeah. that that is a severe problem, but it's a severe problem for the kind of governments that we would like. I don't call them necessarily democracies. I mean, it is the word I have grown up with, and it is a convenient marker for a type of government that I do believe in. But regardless, I mean, having the space for human evolution to have a space for thought to roam free, I mean, you know, you will appreciate that my training was partly in another language and in another culture. And I read poetry in another language. And there was this famous Nobel laureate poet named Rabindranath Tagore, one of his Bengali poems was translated into English and has had quite a lot of reach even in other countries. And, you know, it begins where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free. So, you know, this was part of the ethos of what independence meant to a post-colonial society and what it meant to be, you know, standing liberated in a sense, but I think that we've lost the sense that science arose out of a kind of buying into a vision of the common good, that this is a thing that people do together. And, and when it really works with breakthroughs, which, you know, you could count the COVID vaccines as among those breakthroughs, that, that there is a universalism, there is a sense in which pushing back the frontiers of ignorance will in their own way, in their own time, you know, through pathways that we cannot, con you know, predict totally, uh, take us forward in a sense. But I think you're absolutely right to suggest that the, that the loss of faith is with the institutions with which we govern ourselves, and not so much the idea of science. It's when the idea of science and the imperfect institutions, including the bad scientists. I mean, that's also part of the bad institutions. I mean, it's only when they flow together that we get these problems. Yes, absolutely. I completely agree. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we're going to bring back Natalia Shulga for a discussion between her and Sheila Jasanoff.
You have to put my video on. I cannot unmute myself. Got it. Okay. Okay. So, Natalia, nice to see you. And of course, I heard your prior conversation with some interest. And of course, it's with great trepidation that I might ask what has become the opening gambit, which is to ask, how does it go with you? But let me try to make the question a little bit more pointed, because there are so many different ways in which science may be facing uh, challenges of a, an unprecedented kind, and it could be the destruction of collaborations and hence social networks and infrastructure. It could be the undermining or destruction of physical infrastructure. It could be people leaving the country and not knowing when they will return. So could you say a little bit about how uh, you are seeing it in the context of being in Kiev and, and what seem to be the biggest um, problems for the next five or 10 years? Thank you for this question, or I don't know, not even a question, uh, but uh, desire to comprehend uh, what's going on in Ukraine. And I want to stress the question that we went through the basic reform on education, all type of education from uh, the birth, preschool, uh, elementary, middle school, high school, and higher education, and also science and scientific or technological or technical activities. That's the name of our new laws. So we were at the position for the fast start to remodel, to rebuild existing system, post-Soviet system. And then war happened. And war happened in 2014. Not now. It, it, it is for eight years now. And because of that, resources for any type of research were uh, minimized. And because we traditionally had the separation of good quality research and higher education. So for the good quality research, we had institutes of the National Academy of Sciences. And most of our universities are teaching universities. The liberal arts, they're not really producing much of good research. It's not like 100%, but we just have a few. So the reform was aimed to change that proportion and to rebuild the whole system. And we started doing it step by step. Yes, slowly, but we were progressing. And this escalation, which happened this year, basically stopped the reform and it produced tremendous impact on our system, both educational and research system. And I'm not even talking, and you're absolutely right, about the damaged buildings and laboratories, like Kharkiv, which was hit so badly that they lost most of their research laboratories. But people, when I talk to our and I had a conversation like a week ago. What we should do to let those people to come back. We have over 200,020 students of different levels, bachelor's, master's, graduate students who left the country. 220,000. If I will say that we have about 30,000 researchers working at the National Academies of Sciences, it's 10 times less than we had before the Soviet Union collapse. You can understand what kind of challenge we have now. So to me, the first priority question is how to make the condition that those young people will come back. So it, it, it's, it, 
great challenge. And uh, the second thing which I believe this um, project on uh, impact of pure science, which we are reporting today, this report which put together, helped me a lot to emphasize that behind discussion how you describe type of research, fundamental, pure, um, implied or technology or innovation, beside all these conversations of terminology in Ukraine, education and science are not the priorities yet. It's finance on residual principle every year. That's why it's so low, why it's such a confusion. It's not a building assets. It's not like investment in human capital. No, it's a residual financing or it's your expenses, not investment, expenses. And this is a huge thing we have in Ukraine. And I try to make this change to new understanding that there is no country without smart people. There is no country without good education and research. At least in the more modern world, there is no country like that. So every successful country has good education and good research of different kinds. And it's investment. It's not just expense. So that's what I would like to say to your question. And if you have more, I'm ready. Well, just one, um, I mean, that was an eloquent and obviously difficult thing for you to talk about and describe. And I think it's important for people to know that you feel that this is not just a matter of 2022, but that this has been an ongoing situation. And what you describe about the about the stalled reform is uh, obviously quite anguishing to people who had been working on the reform. So thank you for telling us about that. But just to maybe conclude, I mean, not exactly on a note of hope, but at least a little bit uh, analytical. I mean, I think that one of the, I mean, there, I'm around in a lot of discussions about whether science is getting what it deserves or not. And our session is called in favor of pure science. So not science in general, but pure science. And one hears two different kinds of arguments about this. And you seem to dwell on one of them. And I'm just curious to have your thoughts a little more definitely about this. So one argument is that you invest in pure science because there is a linear process of innovation. Sooner or later, the discoveries will produce benefits and they may be surprising, but they will come at their own speed and we can't predict it, but it's because of the societal benefits that we know will research. Like we put money into mRNA today and we don't know when there will be a COVID, but there will be a COVID. You know, so that's a kind of utilitarian and economic justification. The other justification though is something to do with this human capital, that a good society is an educated society, but also an inquiring society, a society that wants to learn and know and understand more about its own condition, and that in all societies, there should be room and there should be support for that kind of development. And pure science is just like pure poetry or like pure filmmaking or whatever, a domain of creativity that we should encourage for its own sake without a sense of exactly what utility it will produce down the line. So I'm just curious in Ukrainian thinking, especially at the time of the reform, and even now, can you identify whether either of these two reasonings have been prominent? And if so, which one? Or if it's different, then what are the arguments for yeah. pure science? I think I think we struggle um, with these arguments as much as any other country, even the United States of America, because people want fast results. Um, people who govern the country, especially who are looking at the budgets, they want arguments that what's the fast results, what's the products, you know, how it will improve the economy. So we still struggle with that. And it's interesting in Ukraine, because if you look at the data and because we report, not according to Frascati manual, <laughs> but with our own system, you will 
find very interesting the most of investment going to pure sign but it's not true because it's kind of umbrella which let people with you know some applied science to get some money from this little very tiny grants for pure science because the foundation the first foundation which was created in 1992 it was a foundation for pure science fundamental science in ukraine so they got the money so they got this grant system they practice it so people who do apply to research apply to fundamental research get a little grant and, and do the applied research but you know when you report <laughs> statistics show that we invest a lot in pure research but it's not Correct. That's why Frascati manual is so essential for Ukraine, and it would be implemented maybe this year or next year. It's at the level of the ministry, cabinet of ministries and ministry of education and science. I follow that path. We just received these communications that they are working on it. They will be publishing it, but it's still very difficult to convince people that you need to have this niche. And I try to explain to our um, you know, politicians and other people who are not in research, but they listen, they want to listen because they, they puzzle or they intrigue, or uh, they're curious what it's all about, science, what is this? I said, imagine, when you use family budget, you always put aside some sum for your funeral, whatever, for your children education, for some a future development, you budget it. You have this niche and you save from your daily budget, whatever, and you have this money. The same with pure science. If you don't budget it, if you don't have this niche, you basically cut off this whole field which produce and reproduce the good, curious researchers, which might contribute pure science and make discoveries, or maybe they will go to applied science or even work in innovation using existing technology, putting them together because they develop this type of thinking. And I would claim that our education system, which we put in the law, is the best in the world because, you know, it's on a paper, elementary school only developed because of this war, it's, it's kind of on pause, but uh, we use the best practices and we will start with this developing of curiosities in young children for school children and then continue on and on how it's done in Finland and other Scandinavian countries show dramatic switch for the economy, but they start with small children and go on. So. We need to fight with a little niche, otherwise our education will fail in the long run. Thank you. This was a wonderful conversation um, and a great way to kind of end this round of um, interviews. Um, so thank you for everyone who contributed um, today. We do have some questions from the chat that we wanted to be sure to um, ask um, everyone. And so I'll start with the first question. What disproportionate impacts, if any, has COVID-19 had on pure basic research compared to more uh, use-inspired research? And so anyone can, oh, Natalia, you go ahead and jump in. <laughs> well, I'm a biologist. That's why it's more easy for me to comment. Um, I think it was tremendous when people understood that what is RNA, you know, what is PCR, you know, they, they finally learn some fundamentals about modern biology. And uh, I think people start thinking, you know, those strange people who work on RNA and PCR for 20, 30 years, finally, they got unique vaccine, which is delivers you know, information straight to the immune system. I think it was very serious impact on understanding the value of this fundamental science about things people never heard before. And they learned. 
during the COVID year. I see you, um, Sheila. You can comment. She's muted. Yeah, I was trying to get myself unmuted. So um, I wish I could be as optimistic as Natalia. I do think that for people who do science policy, it was a revalidation of the fact that uh, investments made over a long period of time can produce results when needed. And I think that it will stand as a case study for how to do science policy in relation to, I mean, people have known that pandemics are going to be a challenge confronting humanity for a long time. And studying the details of how the infrastructure for that research got laid down, how an institute in Germany that was doing cancer research was able to move its products into the COVID space, you know, that these will be important lessons. But at least speaking for America, which still does control a fairly large population, I fear that it does not translate into a lesson for the public as a whole. I don't think that um, the sort of polarized other half of the American population uh, sees the, the COVID vaccines as a victory. I mean, in fact, there is a tendency, regrettably, in some parts of our society to write this off as yet another example of science working hand in glove with the state to promote interests that are not necessarily the interests of people. So I think going back to an earlier point that was being made in the discussion that I had with William, the, the question of how you interpret the story depends on how you interpret what the nature of trust was that people had in their institutions uh, at the start. Okay. So let's segue into the next question. Thank you for that. Um, what are the best approaches to communicating to the public and policymakers about pure science research, at least um, in the English speaking world? And I'll add one more thing to that. And what is the best phrase, just generally curiosity driven, pure, basic, fundamental, or something else. <laughs> Go ahead, <laughs> Natalia. Okay. Um, again, from uh, my experience, we when we started to work on the reform, we need to uh, talk to the public. And my approach was to bring all stakeholders together for this new legislation process. And we found out that the best ambassadors for science are young scientists and uh, high school students. And uh, fortunately in Ukraine, we have an organization called Young Academy of Science so it's worked with school children on uh, some research projects. And we start producing different type of events. It's like scientific picnics in the parks, um, some um, conferences and uh, events, uh, and we communicating with every broadcasting uh, stations, um, radio or TV. And uh, we also had STEM girls program running now for over seven years. And um, when we invited the good uh, scientists, female scientists, and it became very important uh, resources for uh, talking about science in the society. So it, it's all accumulated in the positive election process for the new law and new reform. Because at the beginning, the, nobody believed we need any. Mm -hmm. Everybody seems to be satisfied and it was not true. But you know, the public was not informed about what's going on. So now it's continuing during the war time, we have about 25 Nobel Prize laureates subscribed for the um, program uh, to talk, to give a lecture to Ukrainian uh, school. Uh, students. So it, that's the process is continuing, you know, and when you keep it um, in a way, every week we have something about science, it works, it produces results. So we can see many students apply for um, 
uh, natural science programs at the university at much higher level of application than 10 years ago, for example. So we can see these results. So you really need to talk to different strata of society, especially young people. And of course, you have to work with stakeholders and with the um, people in parliament. It should be like constant, constant work with them. And you can find the different way of doing that. Fortunately, in Ukraine, we had it after um, Revolution of Dignity. Um, but maybe other country can learn from us. But, you know, I hope, I still hope that we can continue to be proactive in this way. Thank you. And so I'd like to hear from others on this question about, you know, what is the best way to kind of communicate about this and what do we call it? But also, <laughs> You know, what scientific questions are we placing before young generations today? Kind of thinking what I'm going to tell you to share. Okay, and Richard. If my internet hold out, yes, I think language is very important. And so that language of science, or do we talk about research or knowledge uh, generation? Do we talk about basic inquiry or, or applied, applied um, applying knowledge for impact? Um, I, I think um, in many cases, uh, articulating the value can be done. Get too much into the, the semantics of language. One one thing that we are um, learning a lot in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is that interaction between Indigenous knowledge generation, Indigenous systems, and Western science. And so that concept of mataranga for New Zealand knowledge, rangahau research that leads to advancing knowledge, I think has to sit alongside uh, alongside Western science. And we have to be able to be open to generating new knowledge and ideas from the from um, from um, a, a range of different backgrounds and a range of different platforms rather than being stuck on the word science uh, that can that can um, be quite chilling in some conversations and can create tensions rather than unity. Thank you, Richard. And so we'll have our final closing comment from Roxana. Very briefly, um, first of all, the question about what question is asked by the youth should be asked to the youth. We cannot definitely put ourselves in their shoes. Uh, secondly, their questions may be raised by fear, as is the case with climate change, or by imagination, by what they're exposed to. They are exposed to media that presents people downloading food. They might look into that and so on and so forth. So um, just as a, as a final idea, I think we have the responsibility not to shape their minds, but to bring them into the conversation as questions they should ask, not questions we put in their minds or in their mouths. So... Thank you. I mean, I think that's a good way to look forward and a good practice to, um, to take up. So I appreciate um, your comment as well as others. I know that we could continue to discuss <laughs> this topic and the many questions that were submitted by, um, by viewers or attendees, uh, but we do have to close. And so, Erin, um, would you like to say any closing remarks? I just want to thank everybody for participating today. This is really wonderful to bring together all of the 14 different Aspen Institutes. It's the first project that did so, and we span from North America all the way to New Zealand with a lot of places in between. And we're thrilled to have this esteemed group of experts with us today to talk about this important international issue. We've recorded the conversation and we'll make it available on our YouTube and I'll send out the link to all the registrants as soon as it's available. So thank you everybody for coming and thank you for, to our experts for offering your wisdom to us. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.